through the hallways of academia and on the face of the moon the footprints of conquest haven't left us any room to say Greetings and welcome to the 41st edition podcast of Women's Liberation Radio News for this Thursday, September 5th, 2019. My name is Danielle Whitaker and I am happy to be serving as WLRN's resident blog writer since March. In this edition, WLRN documents the existence and growth of women's culture and politics at women's festivals and gatherings both before and after the epic Michigan Women's Music Festival ended in 2015 after sustained attacks by misogynists. We'll hear why cultural and social space designated for women and girls is important for our morale, our emotional health, and our feminist movement. There's an excerpt of an interview Thistle did with Dawn Smith, founder and organizer of the Michigan Family Reunion, an annual gathering that has happened each year since Mishfest closed its gates. Thistle got to talk with Dawn over Skype about her vision for MFR past and present and what her highlights were from MFR 2019. In addition, stay tuned for an MFR 2019 sound collage this episode, featuring the voices of Alex Dobkin, Ruth Barrett, and Nina Paley as they were captured on the ground in the woods of Michigan. MFR 2019, the year of the mother, was a blast. Jenna and Thistle attended and set up a WLRN table in the marketplace, where we met and greeted with diverse women from around the world. Thanks to all of our new subscribers who signed up to receive our newsletter each month that notifies you when our podcasts come out. It was great to meet you and to talk all things radical feminism at the festival. Never going to stop. The team at WLRN produces a monthly radio broadcast to break the sound barrier women are blocked by under the status quo rule of men. This blocking of women's discourse we see in all sectors of society, be they conservative, liberal, mainstream, progressive, or radical. The thread that runs through all of American politics, except for separatist feminism, is male dominance and entitlement in all spheres. To start off today's edition, here's Damianti with women's news from around the globe for this Thursday, September 5th, 2019. In the last few months in India, three women from the already male-dominated field of law have been murdered. In June, Darvesh Yadav, the first female president of the Uttar Pradesh Bar Council, was shot dead by her male colleague in her chamber in the Agra court. In July, a Supreme Court lawyer, Kuljeet Kaur, was found murdered inside her residence in Noida. In August, State Government Counsel Nutan Yadav was shot dead at her official residence in Ita. She was staying at her official residence opposite police lines, where she was shot five times from close range. On August 4th, Connor Betts, singer for the misogynist band Menstrual Munchies, killed nine people in Dayton, Ohio in a mass shooting. Leading up to the shooting, Beth sang songs from albums with titles like Six Ways of Female Butchery and Preteen Daughter Pussy Slaughter, with cover art showing the rape and massacre of female bodies. The Dayton shooting came only 24 hours after a deadly shooting in El Paso, Texas by another male shooter that had left 22 dead. One of the victims in the Dayton massacre was the shooter's sister. On August 5th, The Indian government enforced a complete communication blackout in Kashmir, arrested all leaders, and deployed nearly 50,000 troops in one of the world's already most heavily militarized areas. This was done so that the Indian government could abrogate Act 370, which preserved Kashmir's autonomy until a plebiscite which had historically been promised to the state but never took place, and Act 35A, which ensured that Indians could not buy land in Kashmir. Thus, it has been almost a month since the Indian state has colonized Kashmir, keeping it under complete military lockdown and curfew. In this environment, with the widespread and illegal detention of even children, the women of Kashmir are especially vulnerable, as the military enjoys the power to rape and kill without any accountability under the Armed Forces Special Act. 
In fact, the Indian Army has never faced any consequences for the mass rape of up to 150 women in two villages in Kashmir, Kunan and Pushpura, in 1991. Meanwhile, politicians from the right-wing majority party BJP have been publicly talking about how Indian men are getting excited to marry fair girls from Kashmir. A woman from Unnao allegedly raped by Bharatiya Janata Party or BJP legislator Kuldeep Singh Sengar was critically injured and her two relatives killed when a truck collided head-on with their car in the Rebareli district on Sunday, July 28th. The deceased included the woman's aunt and her sister and also left their lawyer critically injured. This brings the death toll to four, including the rape victim's father and Mohammed Yunus, a witness in the assault. On Monday, September 2nd, the Central Bureau of Investigation recorded the statement of the rape survivor and said that it will submit its report to the Supreme Court on September 6th. Sengar has been in prison since outrage over the case grew and federal investigators stepped in. The multiple threats to the woman's safety show the limits to which men in power can be protected from the consequences of committing sexual violence against women, especially when they are from marginalized communities. A recent report by the Human Rights Watch documents human rights abuses committed against largely Nigerian women and girls who are trafficked for sexual and labor exploitation within and outside Nigeria. The report highlights physical, mental, social and economic impacts of these abuses on survivors and describes significant gaps in and obstacles to much-needed support services. The report is based on interviews with 76 survivors of human trafficking, 20 of them girls between the ages 8 and 17, and with 7 survivors of smuggling, 2 internally displaced persons and 1 victim of forced marriage. Most women and girls interviewed by Human Rights Watch said that they were trafficked by people they knew who prey on their desperation, making false promises of paid employment, professional training and education. They are transported within and across national borders, often under life-threatening conditions. Women and girls said they were exploited in forced prostitution and various forms of forced labor, especially forced domestic work by their traffickers. Women and girls who ended up in Libya described experiencing racial discrimination, arbitrary arrests and detentions, and difficult conditions in places of captivity. Many had no options and had wished to return to Nigeria. Upon return to Nigeria, many women and girls said they struggled with depression, anxiety, insomnia, flashbacks, aches and pains and other physical ailments that have sometimes limited their ability to work effectively. They said they struggled to provide financially for their families, lacked adequate food, or struggled to find money to access healthcare. For some, their suffering is worsened by families who blame them for the abuses, ostracize them, or complain that they returned without money. The Vancouver Rape Relief and Women's Shelter were made the target of vandalism and death threats over their women only policy. Photos shared by their official Twitter account showed several threats and messages scrawled on the center's window, like kill TERFs and trans power. TERF is a slur word for trans-exclusionary radical feminists or feminists who understand that biological sex is immutable and that men claiming to be women is problematic for the rights and protection of girls and women. The shelter is believed to be Canada's oldest and longest standing rape shelter for women. Since 1973, the group has offered support to close to 46,000 women seeking help in their escape from male violence. After opening their transition house in 1981, the organization has housed over 3,000 women and 2,600 children. While the center does not shelter biological males, their official policy is to serve women who identify as trans in addition to women who don't believe in transgender identity ideology. A few days before the threats were scrawled on the windows, one of the women attending a support group at the shelter encountered a dead rat nailed to the door. This support group was for battered women and rape victims. In Liberia on August 21st, a diverse group of women gathered directly opposite the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, where the President's office is located, holding placards and chanting slogans saying they are, quote, tired of all forms of violence perpetrated against women in Liberia, unquote. 
Naomi Solanke, one of the organizers of the sit-in action, told Front Page Africa that the protest would be a continuous process aimed at bringing the government's attention to the alarming situation of violence against women and girls on a daily basis. Naomi said, quote, Women need to feel safe. We are tired of the excuses. We are tired of girls being killed and we don't have no concrete action being taken by our government. Our government is supposed to ensure that all its citizens are secure and women are the soft target in Liberia when it comes to both election and domestic violence. Unquote. In China, up to 1 million Uyghurs, Kazakhs and other Muslim minorities have been arbitrarily detained in internment camps, according to the UN and human rights groups. Researchers have claimed that the facilities are being run like wartime concentration camps as part of a quote, systematic campaign of social re-engineering and cultural genocide. Unquote. According to former detainees, Uyghur Muslim women are being sterilized in these camps. Quote, they injected us from time to time, unquote, claimed Gulbahar Jalilova, who was held for more than a year in one such camp. Quote, we soon realized that after our injections, we didn't get our periods anymore. Unquote. Most of her time was spent with up to 50 people packed into a cell measuring just 10 feet by 20 feet. Former detainees have previously told of torture, beatings and electrocutions, as well as being forced to eat pork, attend political re-education lessons and sing political songs. On August 16th, Hundreds of women demanding protection from Mexico City's police force took to the streets after a number of high-profile sexual assault cases involving serving officers. To shouts of, I do believe you, and my friends protect me, you don't. The initially peaceful rally ended with some participants lighting a fire on the second floor of a police building and vandalizing a bus station. The protesters also sprayed graffiti on the capital's independence monument, adorning the base of the stone edifice with the slogan, Damned Pigs. Two reports of attacks on women in August sparked the outrage and bitter recriminations against the Mexico City's police force, with protesters mobilizing on social media through the hashtag, No me cuidan mi violan, or They don't protect me, they rape me. Finally, we are happy to announce Grace Adetoro's release of the new spoken word piece, Turf is a Slur, on August 20th to the YouTube channel Radical Responses. Thank you, Grace, for giving voice to a whole generation of women who are waking up and understanding that trans politics is misogynistic and homophobic. That concludes WLRN's World News segment for Thursday, September 5th, 2019. I'm Damayanti, WLRN's youngest collective member from India. Share your news stories and tips with us by emailing wlrnewscontent at gmail.com and letting us know what's going on. If it wasn't for the women, women, we would not be living, living. We would not be joyful, singing, loving and beloved again. If it wasn't for the women, women, we would not be living, living. We would not be joyful, singing, loving and beloved. Keep going. If it wasn't for the women, what would we do? We wouldn't have health or strength or beauty. We wouldn't have a home. We wouldn't have food. If it wasn't for the work of the women, if it wasn't for the women, women, we would not be living, living. We would not be joyful, singing, loving and beloved. Women, if it wasn't for the women, what would we do? We wouldn't have art or crafts or music. We wouldn't 
That was Alex Dobkin with her song, If It Wasn't For The Women. Next up, we'll hear excerpts of an interview WLRN's Thistle did with Don Smith, founder and organizer of the Michigan Framley Reunion near Wayland, Michigan. So a lot of women are talking about MFR 2019, the year of the mother, and how it was the best fest ever. And I definitely had that. I walked away from MFR 2019 with that feeling. And um, I'm just wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that and, and how you create the village um, and how amazing this year's fest was. Thank you. <laughs> there are so many parts to that, but um, 2000, 2016, we didn't have a theme. It was just a one day event in our backyard. But then when we went to a, a weekend festival, we, I, I thought we need a theme and 16, we gathered women together that were missing Mishfest so hard that, that we needed to create a container for that, that love and missing. So we created that container. And then we wanted to build not just something, um, a replication of Mishfest, but our own festival. And I wanted to honor the crones. So our first year, we, we did the year of the crones, the year of the elders. And we, we, had, we wanted to ask the blessing of the, the elders that had created and put all that love and knowledge and wisdom into Mishfest all those years and bless the MFR with that knowledge. And 17 was a growing year. Then we went into the maiden. And then, of course, we went to the mother. And this year was the year of the mother. And we put that energy right from the beginning. We went to a ritual over at Ruth and Falcons. It was a beautiful ritual. It was a full moon ritual. And it was asking the blessing for the year. And one of the things I asked for on a personal and professional level was the blessing of being a better mother and putting that energy into MFR. Me and Monica were both at that festival and we asked for that blessing and we put that intention in. And each one of our work crews, and I think that's what sets MFR, brings the spirit of Mishfest, but also our own energy into this new pine forest, this, this new little village of all the work crews. We gather together, we put our sweat equity in, we learn new things, we fight, we cry, we're exhausted, we're sweaty, we're gross, we're, we're not always on our best, but we're on our best because we're women and we're raw. And we created that container by each one of those work crews. We had a container of safe space where we could learn and grow and be women together. And each one of those, we, I would, I don't, and I would try to mention it to the people I was working with, what does it mean to be a mother? What does that mean if you have children, if you don't have children? Because even if you don't have children, Monica talked about this a lot. We, we women are nurturers. We are mothers by spirit. And we do that in different ways. And it shows up in different ways, whether that's working with tools and construction or working with people. I mean, in like my, my day job, I'm a nurse. Monica's an electrician. Both of those are building things just in different ways. And so we brought that spirit and we tried to help the women have that spirit going into festival. And mm -hmm. our crew was so, so bonded. There was women that came every weekend and we didn't have a lot of women that came to the work crews, but they were so dedicated and they loved the intention so hard. And two of those women had never been to a festival, never been to a women's festival, but they believed in it so hard because we have, we have a lesbian community here in Lansing that we, we have events and we gather. So it's not just Mishfest women that remember and miss Mishfest that are coming to MFR, but there were so many new people that were like, Hey, we saw your Ad. we saw this we like this we're they're radical feminists they're younger women they they came because they said what the heck I've never done this and they did it and it was it was amazing everybody came and I think Mimi mentioned this from the sta stage and maybe Renee mentioned it talking about how maybe the numbers weren't as big this year and they weren't we had a little bit less numbers than we did last year um Last year, we were at around 6, 650. This year, we're at 
525, 550, around there. Um, but the presence, the spirit, the energy, it was so much bigger. It was so filling. It, it, yeah. The women filled that space with their energy, and it was incredible. I have to it was incredible to for that. me. I have to attest to that. And it was unexpected, you know, because I skipped one year. I must not have been there for the maiden. I was there for the crone year and I was there for the um, 2016, the, the first one. But yeah, I stepped into that space and I could feel that there was a container that had been created and that it was very distinct and that I just felt a lot of passion, like women's it was a very passionate and like the the logo of the woman sitting and her being orange and yellow and like a flame i i mean it was just there it was, was intense so vibrant. imagery yeah it was so vibrant it was so vibrant and um so you know and like you said we the women who showed up to that created that space and you know there were always every mish fest was a different mish fest because each year, different women, I mean, it, some of the same women came. There's always like a core village of women that gather, and, um, but it expands and it ebbs and it flows. And I, I just was so impressed by the feeling and the culture that was generated in the year of the mother. And now we're going into the year of the dragon, and I'd love to hear you talk about how that theme was, uh, was <clears throat> founded and well about. we we've come to the end of that cycle you know the mother maiden and crone we've 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 went through that and of course we we always start over and it's always cycling and and flowing through us but i was actually talking to my dear friends and collaborators they bring so much to this um bearded dragons i was talking to jay and shen and and how they weren't coming to um mfr this year and they were very very sorely missed and and i made a decision to not fill their vendor space which was a prime vendor space um because they're going to come back next year and i didn't want them to be forgotten because shen of course created our our beautiful vibrant imagery of the the year of the mother our energetic mother that was everywhere there um and i said what are we going to do next year and you know their dragon of course is spelled with a y and we said next year's going to be a year of the dragon and we just threw it out there and i said why the heck not and then I had to think about what does that actually mean? What does it mean? What, what spirit, what qualities, what skills, what energy does it mean to be a dragon with the gyn, G-Y-N, at the end? And if you know yeah. the Latin root of gyn, that is woman, wife, mother. That is the Latin root of gyn. And dragon, dragon has a lot of, lot of fairy fairy tales about it myths mythical stories of a dragon um in europe the dragon is fierce and evil and they're always trying to slay that dragon but in the asian cultures in japan in china vietnam and actually in in the americas the dragon is not an evil being to be slayed it's an it's a being that you want to have because they protect they're fierce fierce warriors so they will hunt you down, but they protect their village. They protect their tribe. They protect their nest. They protect their egg. They protect their young. So while they are very fierce and sometimes they can look scary, they're actually formidable warriors that you want on your side and that you want to embody that spirit of. So it's that woman dragon that is going to be fierce and a warrior and is going to fight the battles that we need to fight to create mm -hmm. that safe space for the women. So yeah. How freaking appropriate is that? That's year perfect. of the dragon for the fifth year, our fifth anniversary. Five yeah. Years. I, we are gonna, you know, we are going to build up that culture of being warrior women, not yeah. just in our village. But I love it. To protect our village and to build our village bigger. We, we, right. we, we can, we can expand our village, not just at MFR, the land, these women spaces that are being created and contained, because we're not the only one. I think ours is the best, of course, but I might be partial. Um, yeah, we can all be no, dragons. No, yeah, you're totally right. And I just love how this vision 
is so, you know, for lack of a better word, inclusive. It's like, yeah, we can have a festival all over the land. It can be on Mishfest land. It can be in the Pines. It can be in Wisconsin. It can be in California. It can be anywhere Ohio. all over the planet because really that's what the planet needs is a woman's village to heal it. And we are, uh, I would say the better half of the species and it's, it's imperative that we, that we rise and heal, heal ourselves, heal each other and heal the earth. And right. I just, and, I mean, let's just think yeah. about this just a little bit step further. I mean, the Amazon's burning right now. Alaska's right. burning right now. There's so many fires. There's so many fires. But what fire can contain a fire? More fire. I mean, and I don't know how that's going to play out. Our fire, our energy, some, a lot of people have been posting, you know, about meditation and sending water and sending spirit to heal these places. And we need to do that right now. Let's gather mm -hmm. our fire and let's let's send some energy to all these places that are burning because mother's crying. Mother's yeah. crying. Yeah. Oh my goodness, Dawn. I, I I just feel so blessed to be a part of our community and to feel it expanding. And I want to thank you and all of the workers and visionaries at MFR for holding that, creating that container holding that space and allowing us to come and express our passion and create a culture that stays with you in your day to day after you, after you've left, you know, and to have another year to look forward to It's what was your highlight cool. of this, of this year's festival? Do you, ha if you had to choose one, I know that it's hard, but just, I would have to say it was that last rendition with MFR house band of that mashup that they created of mm -hmm. um, Amazon Warrior Princess and um, Amazon Women, you know, on closing night and the energy was just so freaking incredible. And it just felt like we were going to bring all of that in, all of that fire and all of that passion so that it could hibernate and brew for next year. And fill us all up so we could take it out to our, our homes and our other communities. Right on. Our listeners are largely lesbian and radical feminist listeners. We have a lot of younger listeners, which is really um, exciting. Um, so I, if you have a message for them, go for it. <laughs> I do have a message. Come to MFR, create women's space, support women's space. It, this is, I, I hate even talking about money, but the truth of the matter is the number one way we can support women's space is by our bodily presence, which often costs money. So support it. You need to show up. And I'm so, so, so thankful that you did show up this year. And everyone that came and had never been and the women who had been said they're going to go out and they're going to bring 10 more. Do it because you don't know what you're missing until you're there. You don't know that you needed it unto your inner woman's space. And that's the predominant theme that I've heard from women that came this year that had never been to a woman's space, never been to a woman's fe festival that might even have had more of an attitude like, why am I there? I, I, one of the women that came this year works on a pride board and she got a lot of crap for coming to MFR because of our, our policy of being woman born woman and very pussy and woman centric. I'm not gonna say that we're any, I'm not going to put any negative words and in, in meaning on that. What I'm going to say is we welcome women and we are woman centric and we're pussy centric. And that's what we're, what we're honoring and embracing. And you don't know, she said, I didn't know how healing it was going to be. I came to this festival trying to be open-minded, but also knowing that I support our trans sisters and you don't unsupport them. MFR doesn't say we don't support our trans sisters because we do. We're saying we need this space too, and you deserve that space. We can all have a space because the world is big enough and it all can be healing. Hmm. But until you've been at a woman's space, you don't know what you're missing. So bring somebody so they can feel it and they can learn it. Mm -hmm. So, a and, woman. And our website has been updated. We will, of course, be having our thankful for Sister Time sale which we always do at a much lower price than as the year progresses because yeah, 
check out the new <laughs> website, check out the tickets. They'll be on sale for a while and we can't wait. Next year's going to be amazing. Amazing. Yeah. We start work cruise. Actually, we're still doing work cruise. We're going to finish up this year. Um, so a couple more Saturdays, another month of Saturdays, we'll be working up at the farm. We'll start our official 2020 season of work cruise, the middle of March. I know. That's nice. So many opportunities for women to come together. Yeah, just thank you so much for your work, Don. Thank you. Thank you so much for asking me about this. I appreciate you and the work you do. Now we turn to a sound collage of women talking, attending workshops, and singing on the land at MFR 2019. Our collage begins with a short interview with singer-songwriter Alex Dobkin that was captured at the end of her workshop entitled Lesbian Issues. Next, you'll hear an excerpt from Thistle's workshop she offered called Being Radical Feminist in Patriarchy, Stories from Madison and Beyond. Then the listener moves into brief interviews with Nina Paley and Ruth Barrett, who were captured relaxing in the radical feminist space Ruth set up in the marketplace. Finally, the sound collage concludes with a stroll through the festival grounds and a song circle. Our collage starts off with the classic Mishfest song by Nidra Johnson, August Moon. Mothers and daughters, women born, women, and we gather in the light of the August moon. Amazon women, and we're out in the woods, and we heal by the light of the August moon. Powerful women, creative women, dancing in the light of the August moon. Girls and women in the Michigan woods, and we love by the light of the August moon. Calling all my female friends, you come and gather in the place to be. Yeah, I'm talking about Michigan, don't you want to come home with me? Where I see you, and you see me. We witness for each other, our commonality, yeah. Mothers and daughters, women born, women, and we gather in the light of the August moon. Amazon women, and we're out in the woods, and we heal by the light of the August moon. Thank you, thank you, Alex. Thank you, Alex. Thanks for the conversation. And remember, we're having our OLOC, Old Lesbians Organizing for Change, gathering. August 21st to the 25th in Columbus, Ohio. And uh, I hope you come. We have programs for younger women, too. Hey, Alex, I'm recording. Could I get a few words sure, from, from you for sure. WLRN listeners? Yes. They're primarily younger lesbians right. and radical feminists. What Can you tell us who you are, just a little bit about who you are and your legacy and what you just did here at MF, MFR? In a few words? In a few words. Yeah, yeah my whole life. My name is Alex Dobkin. I'm 78, pushing 80. I live in Woodstock, New York. I have one daughter and three grandchildren. And ever since I came out in 1973, I have been a fighter for women-only space. And it's so precious and so rare. And it has to be treasured. And so I hope I, I invite all, all women to participate in women-only space, women only for our own purposes, not to make a quilt for men, not to do something for the community, but for us, our community. Isn't that selfish? How yes. can we be so selfish? How can we be so selfish? Let's try and see. And you're also a singer-songwriter, right? Yes, I am. And That's I understand that you're the first lesbian singer-songwriter that got a record deal. Is that true? I didn't get a record deal. I made a record deal. I, we, we formed our own record Olivia company. Records. No, no, I had nothing to do with Olivia. It was uh, Women's Waxworks. And uh, it was Kay Gardner and I. And we produced Lavender Jane Loves Women in 1973. What do you want to say to the young lesbians and young radical feminists out there that are listening? Look us up. Check us out. We have so much to offer. Listen to our music. Uh, you may not like the form. I'm a folk singer. Not everybody is a folky. But listen to the words. Listen to what I'm saying. Lyrics matter. Lyrics matter, especially to me. I mean, music to me is a vehicle for lyrics. <laughs> so right I love on. music, but to Thank me it's so to much. get the, the message across. Thank oh, you so thank much. You. Mm. Thank you. Oops, for your work. 
Yeah. I'm a singer-songwriter, too. I don't Are know you? if you knew that, but I've been blacklisted in my town, so I can't play out anywhere. Wow. <laughs> they use all the same. I mean, they're just the same. Yeah. It's all the, they're all the same. They never yeah. change. We change, and we're still the same, too. Uh, Thank I know. you. Thank you. All right. Good luck with your radio show. Thank you. Tune in, WLRN. Oh, you got the sticker. Nice. First time I came to festival, learned I'd always been afraid. Finally lay that burden down I could not believe the way Of all the trauma I had carried Deep inside my bones Expectations limitations. So like I said, I'm Thistle Pedersen And I'm a founding member of Women's Liberation Radio News And we're recording today for a future podcast And... Um, We've been doing the podcast for three years and three months, starting the first Thursday in May of 2016. I've always been an activist, and I've been an activist on the left. Um, And I've been an environmentalist, and I love community, and I love community organizing, and I love community gardens, and I love working together collectively. And I had all of those values and principles in mind when I approached my community radio station, 89.9 FM, WORT in Madison, Wisconsin, um, which is a leftist radio station that believes in collective action and has a lot of the same traditions that I believe in. And so, but it's in patriarchy, right? It exists in patriarchy. This is just the truth. (laughs) Everything exists in patriarchy except for women only organized spaces. And I think that that's so important to remember. Uh, about the class distinction between men and women. Even one man in the presence of a hundred women creates a new power dynamic, a new situation for us to try to subvert. And so um, when you walk into your leftist, progressive, liberal, radical, even community radio station in Madison, Wisconsin, that's got this reputation for being super- all these things my whole life that I've embraced as a safe place for me to have free discussion of ideas and to feel com- comradeship and solidarity, you know. No. So I was banned from the community radio station for interviewing Sheila Jeffries, who wrote Gender Hurts, uh, a feminist analysis of the politics of transgenderism. In 2014, she released that book. And I was like, whoa, I can't believe this is happening. And I was so confident. I'm like, I'm so embraced. I, I was organizing these large group bike rides that are amazing. I highly recommend that you come on a women only bike ride with me at some point because I organized 35 people to ride their bikes in intentional community from Madison to St. Paul in 2008. Anarchist, like socialist, young people, mostly women actually, badass women who are like ready for an adventure and living offline and feeling the wind on your face and feeling what it feels like to be in your body as a creature on the land, sharing space and and time together for 12 days 24 7 going into a police state because it was the republican national convention so this was like a revolutionary act literally with the bicycle wheels amazing amazing experience i'm so glad that i come from that tradition of activism so anyhow this is where i was and i thought that i would forever be embraced by the the leftist community I thought that I would never be libeled. You can <laughs> pass this around. This is the LGBTQWTF magazine that's free <laughs> for everyone in Madison. And this was on every street corner and in every coffee shop and community center for two months in Madison. And it calls me a hateful bigot. It's literally the LGBT and XYZ magazine. Does anyone know what XYZ stands for? Examine your zipper. Examine your zipper. Oh, maybe maybe it's that because you need to check your, you need to make sure you don't know, right? Nobody knows. It's all fluid. We don't know. So X, Y, Z, I need to examine my zipper and find out because every day it's a new gender, right? So, but anyhow, so this is our LGBTQ magazine 
there are lots of lesbians represented in this magazine, but when you read about Thistle Pedersen, you read that she is a turf that hates trans people, and it's right here. And you can just pass that around if you'd like. That was in print for two months in my town. <laughs> I'm riding my bike up to the Capitol to go to the farmer's market, and I'm finding it fr free around the Capitol Square. You know what I'm saying? But it was there for two months, so then what am I going to do? I'm a ninja. I'm a radical feminist. I'm being radical feminist in patriarchy. I rode my bike up to the Capitol, and I stole all of them from all of the points where they were. And I'm like, no, whose house? My house. That was a, a, what we said in 2011 when we occupied the Capitol and started the Occupy movement. Mm. Started in Madison, Wisconsin, and I slept in the Capitol along with black families from Milwaukee, sleeping in the Capitol during the Scott Walker era, our gover governor. And so, like, I'm not, I'm not um, a housewife sitting at home that's, like, maybe a conservative. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm not. I, I'm an activist. I have been my entire life. And uh, I participated in occupying the state capitol and sleeping there. Um, whose house? Our house. And so if you're going to publish that libel and put it up by the capitol, I'm going to take it off. And you won't know that it's me. I'll ride my bike at night. And I'm not afraid. I can be invis invisible during the day. Wearing a red skirt, riding my bike. I can be invisible during the day because I'm a radical feminist in patriarchy and I'm a weed. And so you cut me down, you mow me down, I grow up through the cracks of the sidewalk, you know? And anyway, the trans activists in my town, they didn't know how much of a weed I was. I don't think they knew how, and that's why they published this shit about me. You know what I'm saying? So, um, I was in 2014 banned from the community, no, 2015 because I did a documentary on the last Michigan Women's Music Festival that you were a part of and it sounds so beautiful. What's your name again, sister? Annie. Annie. And I love Annie is bubbling over with the spirit of Mishfest in her interview. I highly recommend that you listen to that whole documentary. There was so much love put into that documentary. So much love that I got banned from the radio station after that. Um, and uh, so I don't want you to just take things at, at face value. I don't believe that any of you would be banned in the same ways that I've been banned. Um, there were always special circumstances. I have kind of a special personality that goes along with what's happened to me. Um, I want to say that though uh, it's not just personalities that's, that's making this happen. Um, Megan Murphy is also very much under attack by trans activists to the point of her career being harmed as a professional journalist. And um, Nina Paley, her film career, I don't know where she went, she needed to go somewhere else, but I was hoping, I hope she'll come back and tell some of her stories because they are amazing. Um, Laura Tanner is an academic who is currently under attack. Uh, there's all kinds of ways that women and lesbians are attacked by what is called trans activism. Um, one of the ways is that there's a targeting of young lesbian girls in high schools across America to transition, which means uh, having your breasts removed. If, if considering it, you can transition without having your breasts removed, but that is a thrust in the culture. Um, to at least consider having your, your healthy breasts removed by the age of 16. So that's another aspect of trans activism that harms women and girls and lesbians. Um, but the type that I'm talking about harms political discussion. It doesn't just harm women and girls, it harms free speech, it harms civil society. And that's what Megan Murphy is fighting. That's what I'm fighting with WLRN. And um, any woman who puts herself out there in a public way, regardless of her personality, and you know what I mean? Like, I mean, sure, there's unique circumstances, but there's also a physics to this. There's an A that leads to B, that leads to C, that leads to D with trans activism. If you challenge them too much, eventually they will try to come and get you. Yeah. Laura Tanner used her real name 
for a year on social media saying things like men are not women and trans activism is misogynistic and trans politics and gender identity harms our society. She did this for an entire year before she was attacked. I had made my own. Maybe we can't. We can't do nothing about the way they're framing us. We just keep keeping on Cause we know we are love, yeah We know we are love We know we are love We know we are love We're just doing a little show on women's gatherings And you can just say whatever you want This is Nina Paley, you want to say something about women's gatherings? my first one What? Yep How's it been? Did, did your shirt come off? Uh, no, no, but I lifted my my dress skirt and showed people my hysterectomy scars because they were curious. Oh, we that is definitely a women's festival yes, type experience. Absolutely. Yeah, and uh, this is like way outside my comfort, or theoretically way outside my comfort zone, and I haven't camped for 25 years or 35 years or something, and I have been remarkably relaxed and comfortable the whole time, and I'm really glad I came. And yeah, this is this really is like nothing else. So WLRM listeners should get out into the woods with the women, basically. Well, I wouldn't, afraid. I wouldn't say should. <laughs> I'm just glad I did. You know, like I wouldn't have done it because someone told me I should. <laughs> I did it because I'm the mama of WLRM. I'm telling you, you should. <laughs> <laughs> Ruth, you want to yes. add something? Sure. Uh, women's gatherings. It's vitally important that we support and sustain our our female spaces. And uh, Michigan Family Reunion is one of those spaces. And there are other spaces that um, also offer that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking about Daughters of Diana Gathering, which is coming up in right before Halloween. Mm -hmm. It's in Southern California. Um, small, very small uh, festival, wonderful. I'm going to Oregaya too, which is a women, uh, female only festival in Port near Portland, Oregon. And that's also in that, the fall. That's in actually in the middle of August. It's usually the includes the full moon in August, Ooh. so it's coming up shortly. Um, Lovely. I'll be home for ten days and then go. And uh, a lot of women, again, these are a lot of these are called the Acorn Festivals. I mean, Daughters of Diana has been going on for a long, long time, but. Uh, others that ha that began after Michigan Festival closed, and um, this is this is what we need to do. This is the point. You have many many things, many many spaces that women can go. Not just only one space, but many. And small can be really powerful because you get to really have those conversations, really get to have intimate contact with around issues of importance and especially the um to preserve what happens in female only space which can yeah. only happen for the most part in female -only not space. online it can't yeah. happen no no, no. Oh, oh i wasn't even thinking of that of course not because it's it's a it's a, a putrid toilet most of the time sorry but <laughs> online <yeah. laughs> online you know uh, you know speaking it's, of future toilets so. speaking no, no. <laughs> the so toilets are no. very nice here the toilets are great here i have <laughs> I frequent don't be them. afraid of camping no, I, yeah. <laughs> nina yeah. paley has not pooped for three days yeah, I did <laughs> that's finally. the news from yeah. wlrn yeah. wrapping yeah. it up news to me. <laughs> yeah well you know that's its own issue okay that is its own issue um so anyway um what was the question? So, <laughs> women's gatherings and what they are. What I mean, they are. what okay. were you just, you were just doing something I'm with your hands. I what were you I'm, doing? I've been setting up an altar in a Temple of Diana, which is a long time um, Dianic uh, religious organization and temple. Um, I've been setting up an altar in the Temple of Diana tent, which the temple supports as a space for uh, female, um, for radical feminist discussions. This is the reason we don't sell anything in this booth. We have an, uh, we have images that Max Dashu has created, her beautiful posters, um, and we have an altar and we have a pegboard so we can either just hang and talk to whoever comes in or have a topic they want to talk about. And um, this is what the space is. Right, and you were saying that there are lots of different spaces in at women's gatherings, so you yes. can. There are niche spaces. Absolutely. So if you're not interested in 
politics. I don't know how women cannot be interested in politics these days. Okay, I can't even fathom it. If you just want a break. If you just, or you just want a break and you, yes, thank you. Right. And you just want to like, I need to just not think about that thing for now. This is a wonderful thing. You get to just, you could dance all day. You could go to other work types of work. There are parades There's that parades. happen There's spontaneously. The, there was yes. the red dress parade and they provide, there yes. were dresses suddenly the, uh, hung provided. up. Provided. provided. So if you wanted yes. to join the parade, you could yes. put on a dress and you could join the parade. There's a woman of color tent. Yes. There's a woman of color tent, a woman of color sanctuary. Um, and there's wonderful music and uh, that features artists that um, uh, the producer brings. So you get to hear music that you may f be familiar with and also mu musicians and singers that y and spoken word that you may not be mm -hmm. uh, familiar with. And even this year there was belly a beautiful, beautiful belly dance troupe. So it's a celebration of women in all of our glorious diversity. And so, uh, come on we know uh, we down. Love. We know we are love. We know we are love. Mothers and daughters, women born, women, and we gather in the light of the August moon. Amazon women, and we're out in the woods, and we heal by the light of the August moon. Young women, old women, dancing in the light of the August moon. Girls and women in the Michigan woods And we love by the light of the August moon We know we are love We know we love We know we are love We know we love We know we are love We know we love So I'm walking down the trail here Women are lined up for crepes by the lake Oh wait, Kreps by the lakes. Yes, we are in the Great Lakes region. And I'm going to head over to the singers and just capture a little bit of their joy this morning. Every day we are born. Every day we are free. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Happy birthday to me. Every day we are free.
for your sweet self by and by Cause I will be rocks, I will be water I will leave this to my daughter Lift your head up in the wind When you feel yourself grow colder Wrap the night around your shoulders And I will be with you Even then, even when I cannot see your face anymore You are listening to WLRN. Camping in the woods in Michigan this past August, surrounded by women, away from patriarchy, was only my second time doing so. My first time was the Michigan Women's Music Festival's final year in 2015. To refer to Mitchfest as merely an event is to seriously understate what Mitchfest was. In case you haven't heard, Mitchfest was home for thousands of women. It was its own culture. It created community that lasted throughout the year, for decades, that reconvened on its private acres in Northwest Michigan for six days in August. It was for all women and girls. It taught us how to communicate and care for ourselves and value ourselves and each other. Not to mention women organized to fund and literally build and run a village from the forest floor up for a week, every summer for 40 years. Michigan Family Reunion, or MFR, is the festival that keeps Mitch Fest alive, adopting much of the ethos of Fest the safety of women-only space, and the chance for attendees to unburden themselves of patriarchal baggage. You'll pardon me if I refer to MFR as FEST, for a woman such as myself, whose only experience with Mitch Fest was the last year it was held, Framley Reunion is the closest I'm going to get to experiencing Mitch Fest, hopefully throughout my life. For me, one of the things I look forward to the most at FEST is taking my shirt off. It sounds superficial, I know, but truly, the feeling of sunshine, of wind, of the grass between your shoulder blades, of the heat from the bonfire at night, to feel that on your skin where typically you have an elastic bra strap of one sort or another containing your ever-offensive nipple-wielding breasts is a sweet nectar of life. Women-only space enables me to move through the world topless, because I know I will not be preyed upon in any sense of the word. I won't be stared at as if breasts are not normal or are sexually explicit. Breasts are not sexually explicit, for fuck's sake. I've heard women say that it takes time to adjust to the reality of women-only space. That was one of the amazing things about Mitchfest. You may have taken two and a half days to really get comfortable, and you'd still have four days to enjoy that newly acquired sense of security. We are groomed into patriarchy from the jump. We've learned to live with it. And after a lifetime of functioning in that way, there's a comfort in the devil you know, isn't there? Entering into Michigan women's culture, it takes getting used to for many of us. Solidarity, there's a concept. Your sisters are not waiting for the opportunity to pounce on you. Divergent ideas, no, you do not deserve to die in a fire because we disagree. Your woman's body, not just a prop for the capitalist machine. Amazing! I was sitting on the wood bench at the top of the hill from the stage, the tribute to Drum Mama Sue that the Festies built, and I was thinking about this adjustment period at Fest. Why is it even a thing? For as much as adjusting to Fest has to do with relaxing our defenses against male violence, maybe some of this period of adjustment has to do with the fact that we're taught in patriarchy to prize the male experience. Women entrenched in patriarchy are socialized to men just fine, meaning they know how to act and interact with men, they know what to expect from men, and vice versa. But with other women, we experience some hesitation. Our guard is up. 
A woman-only environment is, frankly, foreign. Maybe experiences with other women within patriarchy have informed how we approach women in general. The misogyny we're taught is enough on its own to pit women against each other. Negative experiences with other women within patriarchy only reinforce misogynist beliefs. We must unlearn the suspicion. We must remember that patriarchy is a survival game. We ourselves must unsee women as objects. Fest has magical moments. I laid bare-chested next to a new friend and watched Indigi Femme radiate from the stage. Elena, the duo's drummer, exudes pure joy as she plays. She has a big, beautiful grin that didn't leave her face once. I couldn't take my eyes off her. The MFR house band, affectionately known as the best house band ever, rocked every song they played. The energy at the stage is different from any other show I've been to. The invisible division between stage and audience seems non-existent. And after the stage ends at night, the bonfire begins, and before you know it, you're knee-deep in conversation with a sister you just met about how both your father's functioning alcoholism made all the difference in the social acceptability of their addictions. Or about pickles, kosher dill, half sours, cornicones. The drumming at the fire the first night made me move, and I pretty much hate dancing. The energy was palpable, the celebration undeniable. The second night of Fest, I walked alone from the stage into the woods where the camping was. The light faded behind me, and I entered the kind abyss of the trees and tents. The soft glow of lanterns here and there, colorful lights strung up between the trees. I heard kids moving in their hammocks, stacked up and across from each other, giggling, flashlights erratic. I passed a small group of women drumming, so quietly. Imagine a four-person drum circle at midnight, peaceful and low, entrancing. Then past the campers, things were even darker, and somehow this 32-year-old who was still afraid of the dark couldn't muster a drop of anxiety. The woods could have swallowed me up in her tender embrace and I would have gone down with drums in my ears, the smell of fire in my hair, and love in my chest. The next morning, as the sun realized its potential over the main stage, I lay in the grass, back to the sky, listening to the women's choir praise the goddess and reading a book on Anne Lister. I went to a potluck with Thistle the first night of Fest in the women of color space. It was a very cool thing to be able to share a meal with women I wouldn't otherwise have met, which is actually something I can say about every woman at Fest, but there was something particularly special about being in the women of color space. Mainly knowing this is a sanctuary women of color created for themselves that they opened to anyone interested to share in for that meal. I appreciated the hell out of that. I think intentional community is not a hard concept to understand. Maybe this is coming from a place of privilege somehow, but I personally am not offended because I don't fit the criteria for admittance to that space. I'm happy to wait for an invite and honored to be a guest. And if the invite never comes, good luck and God bless. Can you imagine the level of entitlement needed to assert that you should be in a space you don't belong? I digress. This commentary is very specific to MFR, I know. Not all women's events involve camping. Others have less emphasis on workshops or education or self-edification and are more focused on partying. Most are events open to everyone. All I can say is that the main reason I attend MFR and will continue to attend is because I personally desire to be in an all-women environment close to nature. In this space is the most relaxed I've ever felt. I trust these women around me. We prize each other for the different experiences we bring to the table as women. The heaps of thanks due to the founders and organizers and builders will never be enough. This exclusive women's space is invaluable to women and girls. It acknowledges the difference and value in being female. It acknowledges the reality of male violence and seeks to shield women from it. In a world full of gaslighting and doubt, Fest validates the female experience and connects us. And that connection is where our power lies. I love you, my sisters. I can't wait to see you next year. Thanks for listening to WLRN's 41st edition podcast on women's summer festivals and gatherings, released this Thursday, September 5th, 2019. 
I'm April Now. We always release our handcrafted news programs the first Thursday of every month. Next month's topic will focus on witches and witchcraft as we move into the Halloween season. Look for that program to be dropped Thursday, October 3rd. Thanks for staying tuned to listener-sponsored feminist community radio, WLRN. WLRN would like to thank our guests this month for sharing their views on women's summer festivals and gatherings. Thank you so much, Don Smith, for speaking to me, and thanks to Nina Paley, Alex Dobkin, and Ruth Barrett for speaking with us at MFR 2019. We can't wait to see you again at next year's MFR for the Year of the Dragon. This is Thistle Pedersen. Thanks for tuning in to WLRN. If you like what you are hearing and would like to donate to the cause of Feminist Community Radio, please visit our WordPress site and click on the Donate button. Check out our merch tab and get a nice gift in exchange for your donation as well. In addition, if you are interested in joining our team, we're always looking for new volunteers to conduct interviews, write blog posts, research the world news, post to our Facebook and other social media pages, and do other tasks to keep us moving forward as a collective of media activist women. Shoot us an email at wlrnewscontact at gmail.com if you want to become part of the team. Thanks for listening. This is Jenna DeQuarto, WLRN sound engineer and producer, signing off for now. And this is Danielle Whitaker signing off on another edition of WLRN's monthly handcrafted podcast. You can find us on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, and SoundCloud in addition to our WordPress site. And we are happy to announce that you can now find us on the new social media platform, Spinster, founded by millennial feminist Mary-Kate Fain. Thanks for listening. Dope for the patriarchal kiss.